Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Are you a believer? Are you a follower of Jesus? Or do you sometimes have doubt in your belief? Or maybe you don't believe at all. Well, today on the Gospel Message, we want to look at a text from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 6, where Jesus goes back to his hometown. And maybe we can see the differences between doubt and unbelief in this short passage. My name is Wes Hepner. Thanks so much for being here. We've just seen in Mark chapter 5 the miracles Jesus has done. He's healed this demon-possessed man. He's healed this woman who was sick for 12 years. And he's raised this 12-year-old girl from the dead. And now Jesus goes home. And after all these miracles, after all this incredible teaching, what's the reaction at home? Before we go into that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ and we thank you and we praise you that you are God, that you are good, that you are loving, that you are kind, that you are merciful, that you are true. Thank you that you always keep your promises. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless this program. I pray that you would touch each listener, especially those that are maybe struggling with doubt or maybe in unbelief and do not believe. And maybe this text will help them see what that really looks like. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that teaches us in a perfect way. And I pray that your spirit would be upon each word, that it would be blessed by you. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you have your Bible, take it and open it to Mark chapter 6. We want to read the first six verses and we're going to look at what unbelief means. But first, let's read Mark chapter 6, 1 to 6. It says, And he went out from thence and came into his own country. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these sayings? And what wisdom is this which hath given unto him, that even such mighty works are done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph of Judah, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And he could do no mighty work save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went round about the village teaching. At the end of this, we are told that Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. And so maybe to help us understand unbelief, let's look at the word doubt. Are they the same thing? See, doubt is not the absence of faith. It's the questioning of faith. Listen carefully. You can only doubt what you believe. In Matthew chapter 4, Peter walks out on the water to Jesus. And after a few steps on the water, Peter begins to sink. And then Peter cries out to Jesus to save him from drowning. And listen to what the Bible says. Jesus reaches out, grabs him and says, You have little faith. Why do you doubt? See, Peter had faith, even though it was little. And he had doubt at the same time. Doubt is not the absence of faith, but questions in our faith. This brings us to unbelief. Unbelief is the determined refusal to believe. Doubt is a struggle faced by the believer, the follower of Jesus Christ. Unbelief is a condition of the unbeliever. Unbelief is an act of the will. It's a choice. Unbelief says, I hear what you're saying and I choose not to believe it. I reject what you're saying altogether. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 and 13 says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul is saying, I did these things out of ignorance. I could not understand the truth and unbelief. I resisted the truth. Unbelief means you made the choice to refuse to believe. This is why Jesus had to confront Paul on the road to Damascus the way he did. So what is unbelief? We want to look at four things today. Number one, unbelief ignores the obvious. Number two, unbelief focuses on the irrelevant. 
Number three, unbelief is easily offended. And number four, unbelief hinders the supernatural. And all these four are found in our text in these six verses. So let's start with number one, unbelief ignores the obvious. Look at verse one of our text. And he went out from thence and came into his own country and his disciples followed him. See, this is Jesus' second visit to Nazareth since he started his public ministry. The last time he attended church, he delivered the message. And when he was done, the church people decided they were going to kill him by pushing him off a cliff. Would you return to that church and preach another message? But because Jesus is full of grace and mercy, he decides to return one more time. And this is Jesus' hometown. This is where he was raised. He knew people. He had made friends. And he teaches in the synagogue. Verse 2. When the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which was given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? See, they didn't attempt to kill Jesus on this occasion, but their unbelief had not changed. Jesus' teaching had authority, it was knowledgeable, it was powerful, and it was unmatched. The Bible tells us this. And this is why many were amazed. And this word amazed means to strike or to blast. Today we'd say his teaching was mind-blowing. Yet the amazement of the audience did not lead them to put their faith in him as Lord and Messiah. Instead, they hardened their heart and continued rejection. Rather than recognizing the obvious that Jesus was empowered by God, the people of Nazareth questioned the source, saying, where does he get this wisdom and power to do these miracles? They did not accuse Jesus of being empowered by Satan like other people already had done, but they were also not willing to acknowledge that his power came from God. Their unbelief is seen in their question. In order to maintain unbelief, you have to look for an explanation other than the obvious one. Like the hard ground along the road in the parable of the soil, in Mark chapter 4, verse 15, their hearts were hard. They had been given more than enough evidence, yet they stubbornly refused to believe in him. Unbelief ignores the obvious. It ignores what's right in front of you. Number two, unbelief focuses on the irrelevant. Look at verse three of our text. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. When a person refuses to believe something, they will look for and find other things that support their unbelief, even if they're not important. His occupation, his mom, his brothers and sisters have no bearing on the fact that he had proven he was the son of God. Jesus had healed the sick. He had cast out evil spirits. He controlled nature. He raised people from the dead. He had demonstrated over and over again that he was the Messiah, the Deliverer, the Savior, the Son of God. Unbelief, the refusal to weigh and see the evidence, will focus on the irrelevant, the things that are not important. And my friends, people do the same things today. Unbelief will say, well, Jesus died over 2,000 years ago. He was such a great teacher like many others. How can he change my life today? And maybe that's a good question, but the list could go on and on. Unbelief looks for irrelevant and non-important issues surrounding Jesus in order to write Jesus off. Unbelief is determined to find things and reasons not to believe. And so the people brought up his occupation, his family. They turned to all kinds of stumbling blocks to defend their unbelief. They diverted their attention away from the truth in order to justify their rejection of Jesus. See, they had only known him as the son of a carpenter. They were unwilling to embrace him for who he truly was, the son of God. Their unbelief, their determined refusal to see and accept the truth would not allow them to see Jesus for who he truly was. So in this text, we see unbelief ignores the obvious. And number two, unbelief focuses 
on the irrelevant. And number three, unbelief is easily offended. Verse three at the end says, and they were offended at him. And in verse four, Jesus says, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. The word offended means to snare or to cause to stumble. And that's really what it does when we are offended. It carries the idea of making someone outraged, shocked, disgusted, dismayed, or appalled. They were angry at Jesus because of their unbelief. We're not told exactly what Jesus taught in the synagogue, but the people were outraged. Their unbelief caused them to be offended, to react negatively toward Jesus. I wonder if you've ever been there where people are angry and hurt and offended for what you believe. Welcome to 2022. Our world is like that. Remember, they were angry, hurt, and offended at Jesus as well. Whatever was said at that church, it caused Jesus to conclude this. A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. It's interesting how when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, there's often a huge struggle with family or friends. What will they say? What will they tell others? Will we go to a different church? Will we dress differently? Will we talk about the Bible or Jesus? Will they get angry at us? And that hurts because they're our family and friends. But remember, they did this to Jesus too. Jesus went through this. Pray to him. Ask him to help you. He knows exactly what you're feeling. And lastly, unbelief hinders the supernatural. Look at verse 5 and 6. And he could there do no mighty work save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. The people's unbelief impacted what Jesus did and did not do among them. Now let's be clear, does that mean Jesus was unable to do miracles? The issue was not that he lacked the power to do the miracles. Rather, there was no reason to do the miracles there. Since the purpose of miracles was to confirm the truth and reveal himself as Lord and Messiah and to lead sinners to saving faith. See, these people had already said no to Jesus. They would not believe miracles were unnecessary. Now listen carefully. Jesus does not need your faith to perform miracles. He can heal the sick, cast out demons, walk on water, and raise the dead without anyone believing. He is God in the flesh. He's all-powerful. Jesus is not dependent on people's faith to perform miracles. In Luke 17, Jesus heals 10 lepers, but only one of them confess faith in him. The crippled man at the pool of Bethsaida didn't even know Jesus when he was healed. When Jesus raised people from the dead, he obviously did so without first requiring faith from them. So clearly Jesus' power was not at all diminished by unbelief. Jesus' decision to not perform miracles was an act of mercy. Jesus explains this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 to 24, that when there's unbelief, where people refuse to believe, no matter what the evidence is, if he was to do miracles, it would only make their unbelief stronger and their hearts harder. It would become more difficult for them to believe later. By choosing not to do many miracles among them, Jesus was actually demonstrating mercy toward these people. Jesus loved these people, forgave them for what they tried to do to him a year ago. He taught them the truth. He performed many miracles around Nazareth and in other villages. He had demonstrated over and over again who he was. He was the Messiah and the Savior. And in spite of all this evidence, they held on to their unbelief. And as a result, Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Sadly, you will encounter people throughout your life who are filled with unbelief. They will not believe no matter what you say or what God does in their life. Sometimes it takes a miracle or a major crisis for them to believe. But our job as Christians is to love those people, forgive those people, to care about those people, to pray for those people. Never to condemn or be angry with them, but to show them a better way, the way of a child of God and putting your faith in Jesus Christ. You've been listening to the Gospel Message Radio program. My name is Wes Hepner. Our website is gospelmessageradio.com. 
I pray that you have a blessed next week. Thanks so much for being here.